Hey, I'm Carl Bustles. I'm an environmental specialist with Santee Cooper. I'm with Biological Services. Um, today we're out here on Lake Moultrie. We just wanted to take a look at some flora and some fauna and talk a little bit about uh, invasive species, talk about native species, and, and talk about how we manage the lakes. So this morning I'm going to talk to y'all briefly about one of the really cool native plants that we have on the system that we, we love to see. There's a lot of um, lily pad species that you'll find on the lakes, but this is one of the, the native species that you know everyone loves. And it's one of those things, like if you think about the quintessential lily pad species, when people think of lily pad, it's usually fragrant water lily. And when you see this plant, Something really cool about it is it's you know just got this pretty heart-shaped leaf, um, and a good way that you can ID it is if you can imagine this being a complete circle, and if you took a pair of scissors and you cut it, you'd see that it kind of just folds up like that. So that's and it, people describe it kind of as like a Pac-Man kind of kind of shape right there where it, where it's split. Um, it has very distinct venation on the bottom of the leaf. Sounds like you can feel it. Um, and this, this plant is extremely beneficial. It has a lot of surface area for a lot of uh, aquatic invertebrates and stuff like that to attach so it you know, feeds the bottom of the food chain. So we, um, we like it for that. Um, if you look at the stem, it's really cool. If you can look over there, there's usually about four holes in it. And there's this very extensive uh, rhizome that is in the, in the substrate below us. And these, these veins here, they, that allows gas exchange to occur between the rhizome and the, and the stem and the leaf. Uh, this plant, if you follow it back in history, the Native Americans would actually eat portions of the plant. You can, you can actually cook the rhizome. I don't know if I'd recommend doing that, but they say you can cook it and use it for a kind of a cough um, medicine, medicinal purposes. It has this beautiful, fragrant flower. Um, and they'll open up whenever the sun comes out a little more, but you can see it's got, you know, it's really pretty and it has, it has a beautiful, beautiful uh, smell to it. And something really cool about this flower is that whenever it first emerges out, it's, uh, it's female. So when pollinators come and get down in there to, you know, to get the pollen, it'll close up. And then the next day when it reopens, it'll be functionally male. After that takes place, the flower will close up it'll submerge below the water, the fruit will ripen, and then the seeds will get dispersed. And this plant, you know, provides, you know, good food for um, wood ducks and a lot of other aquatic, aquatic animals. So, you know, we like to see this plant on the system. This here's my favorite plant species, this water shield or snot bonnet. And it gets its name from this jelly-like substance on the bottom. It's an antifungal or antibacterial substance that prevents insect herbivory. Uh, bass love it. I like to fish around it. Up with it. That's an awesome piece. Yeah, that's really pretty. I'm gonna leave it hanging like this. So this is a really cool carnivorous plant called bladderwort. And um, when I say it's a carnivorous plant, that I mean it actually eats insects. So it's kind of like a Venus flytrap that you might see in someone's kitchen. Um, it actually has these tiny little bladders on it, hence the name bladderwort that actually capture small invertebrates uh, and macroplankton um, in the water. So it, it attracts uh, small insects with these enzymes. The insects swim up to it and there's a little air pocket in each of these bladders and that air is released and a little insect gets sucked into the bladder and then digested by the plant for extra nutrients. It's a really fascinating little plant. Native species, beneficial, um, not problematic at all. You can actually see the little black bladders right there. It goes in that biodiversity right there, harboring young of the year fish right there. What am I looking at here? What is it? Talk to me. Uh, a largemouth bass fry. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that bass is um, using all this vegetation uh, to survive his first year. At that size, they're really vulnerable to predation. So in order to avoid being eaten, he's hiding out in all this nice vegetation. So this is another really cool um, lily pad species that we have in the lake. This is um, Big Floating Heart or Banana Lily. And the reason that it has that name is if you look underneath, you'll see these um, banana cluster looking ramets or roots that are underneath. And a good way that you can use the ID this plant is if you flip it over, you'll see this almost like a, like a dark fuchsia purplish color and there's very distinct venation in the leaf and it almost has like a corky texture so whenever you press on the leaf it has a little bit of firm firmness to it 
and uh, this is a great native species. Um, one problem that we are having on our system though is there's an invasive species that's um, um, crested floating heart or Nymphoides cristata and that species can hybridize with our native species and it's like, kind of like your labradoodle that you can have at your house so you know it's a mix of two different dog species but the same thing can happen with plants and what you end up with is a, a hybrid plant that kind of shares a little bit of the similarities from both parent plants and the reason that's a problem is that over time we may lose that original native strain of plant and that's something that we don't want in our system we want to maintain you know the native species that have been here a long time and we, we do our best to ensure that we're trying to take out those hybrid populations and then invasive populations. So we got lucky and had this little eastern amber wings dragonfly land on our boat. One thing that's cool about these guys is they actually try to mimic a wasp so they look a lot more intimidating than they actually are. They really are relatively harmless unless you're maybe a mosquito or some other small insect they're trying to eat. like that caterpillar that cuts part of the leaf and hides under it. Yeah. It might be one of those leaf cutting moths. I don't know. I think that's what it is. I don't know. I Look, there's I... one hatched out right there. That is super cool. That's exactly what that is. It's really cool. American Lotus. This is a super cool plant. It has a giant leaf. So when you're out and you see a plant that's got a giant circular leaf and you'll notice that you know, the stem is attached in the direct center. That's another good identifier that you can use. And something super cool about this plant is that it has these super tiny hairs on the surface of the surface of the plant. So when you throw water on it, it'll actually bead up and kind of skate across the, the top of the leaf. Another really cool thing about this plant is that it actually has and develops its own latex. So if you cut into the plant, see that stringy, stringy white? And that latex helps deter herbivory on the plant. So if an aquatic insect tries to bite into this plant, the latex will gum up its mouth. So it's a defensive mechanism that the plant has evolved to have. The plant will produce this beautiful yellow flower during the summer. And then after it gets fertilized, this seed pod will develop. These seeds right here that form in the seed pod, they're, they're super hard. They almost look like a nut. And at the end of the summer, this seed pod will droop over and fall and it'll fall off into the water and float. And as it degrades, these seeds will drop out and sink to the bottom. Now, the really cool thing about these seeds is that they actually can sit on the bottom for centuries. So you have a seed bank with this, this plant that whenever you see plants that are out in the lake system today, those plants could have started, you know, 100 years ago. I mean, that's, that's crazy to think about, but that just shows that like, when I throw the seed in the water today, it may not germinate for 100 years. So, this is another really cool native plant we have out on the Santee Cooper system. This is called Lemon Bacopa. And how it gets its name is if you take a piece of this plant and you kind of crush it up in your hand, it smells really good. It smells like lemons. Actually, it smells more like pine salt to me, but close enough. But it's a nice native species. Um, it makes for great fish habitat, harbor, harbors all kinds of inver invertebrates, excuse me. And um, fish love it. A really cool um, submerged plant that we have on this is Kabamba. It's a native species. It's a, it's a great submerged plant for, um, for fish and for duck habitat. And if you look in the water, it's this bright green vibrant plant that almost looks like a, like a Japanese like fan that you would use. And one cool way that you can use the distinguishes is whenever you pick it out of the water, it kind of collapses on itself. So in order to see that pretty fan orientation, you almost have to leave it submerged. But this, this plant is awesome. Um, ducks love to land and be around in. The cool thing about this plant is it harbors so many uh, aquatic insects and dragonfly larvae, damselfly larvae, fish fry in the springtime, they can hide in it. And it just supports the ecosystem from the bottom up. It's, it's, a, it's a great way for the food chain you know, to be established. It protects um, small, you know, fish and insects and then the larger fish can come and forage on that and it's just it's just a great plant that we have on the system so this is a native plant that we have on the system. it's called lizard's tail 
and it's easy to see where it got its name you can see this white raceme here which is the seed pod it kind of looks like a lizard's tail and uh, one really great thing about this plant is that the seed pod here wood ducks will actually seek it out to eat the seeds when you have dense stands of this plant it provides great breeding habitat for turtles um, for salamanders, uh, small fish will go up in there and you know pr protect themselves until they get bigger so they can move out into open water. And uh, this plant is one that we have actually kind of helped plant around the system. So something I want to talk about briefly with you all today is you know our department we do a lot of water quality uh, sampling. We also you know spray for invasive species. But another part of our job is we actually try to plant back beneficial vegetation on the system to help wildlife. And this is one of those plants that we've uh, worked with. We've worked with water shield and eelgrass. And the reason we want to do that is that we, you know, we want to not only take away invasives, but also replace them with beneficial native vegetation as well. Yeah. Well, I got something in here. This is kind of cool. So this is a mosquito fish. You can find this little fish in every little ditch and pond um, all over the southeast and all over most of the United States. Um, it's a fascinating little fish because it's, um, you know, most fish lay eggs. This fish actually gives live birth. And this is a female. You can actually tell it's a female because it has this big dot. Oh, there it goes. And it has that big uh, spot on it, um, on the belly right there. Um, and the genus for that is Gambusia. A lot of times people just refer to that as Gambusia. This plant is called alligator weed and the best way to identify it is if it's blooming and it has this little flower on it that looks a lot like a little clover bloom. Um, so this was actually the first invasive species uh, on the Santee Cooper Lakes and about I think 1948 or 1949 they had about 20,000 acres of this. Um, now it's not such a problem. The main way we control it now is through alligator weed flea beetles, which is a, a beetle that only eats one kind of food. It's called monophagus, um, and it only eats this plant, so it doesn't affect any other plants, and it provides really good control. Occasionally we'll use herbicides on it, but it's really not that problematic, and it actually provides some good fish habitat, so we mostly just let it grow. Um, so another way you can identify this plant, it, there are some other plants that look similar to it on the system. Another way you can identify it is the leaves are opposite, they're not alternate. So you see how the leaves are side by side right here. Something else really cool about this plant is the, the stem is hollow. So if it's something like primrose, which is really similar, it's not gonna have a hollow stem like this. This is a plant called pickerel weed. It is a native species and it has this beautiful purple bloom. Um, it's really popular in water gardens and there are a lot of water garden plants that are invasive and that cause a lot of problems. But this is a water garden plant that we're actually okay with. So if you really want to decorate your pond or your water garden, this is a good one to try out. Um, this is a great pollinator species. Um, it's perfect for dragonfly larvae to uh, climb up on and, and hatch out. Um, so it's a, a good plant to see around the system. And this is another plant that we're actually propagating around the system right now. Easy when you're out on the system and we start talking about, you know, beneficial native vegetation to lose sight of some of the things that are right in front of you. And two of those species of trees that we have are the cypress and the, the swamp tupelo. And to my right here is a, um, a pond cypress that we have as Taxodium ascendens. And one really cool thing about this tree is if you look at the base of it, and this is a small one, but you'll notice that at the base of the trunk, it kind of flares out. It's kind of a buttress style, so it's kind of like the Notre Dame Cathedral in France. If you can, you know, envision those walls holding up the church, that's exactly what this buttressing style trunk is doing for this tree, and it allows this tree to, you know, thrive in environments where the, the soil isn't so steady. So when hurricanes come through, it can hold hold in place. Um, Cypress is also very well known for its cypress knees. Now there's there's a lot of debate about what those knees actually do. Some people um, think that maybe they hold nutrients for the plant because it can be in nutrient poor areas. Um, another theory is that as silt and other mucky sediments settle around those knees, it helps hold the tree in place similar to the base of the trunk. And um, something that's really great about these swamp trees that grow in the bottomland habitat is they provide so much habitat for our native wood ducks that can roost in it. You'll come out certain times of year and you'll see anhinga nests that are sheltered up in the limbs. So these trees are great 
So when you're out on the system, you know, we talk about all the great native um, plants that you can see. Don't forget about the cypress and the tupelo because they really are great beneficial plants that we have out here. A lot of people don't realize that we actually have freshwater shrimp in this lake. This is a great little food source for small panfish, for um, bass young of the year. Um, and uh, it's uh, kind of little known that we actually have lots and lots of these throughout our lake system. They rely on this dense native vegetation to survive. So here's another invasive species that we have on the system. It's called uh, water primrose, or Luigia hexapetala is the Latin name for it. And this is a very interesting invasive species in that it has two different leaf morphologies, and that means that it's like bifolia. And so when you see it when it's a young plant, it'll have this almost kind of like what they call rosette orientation, or it almost looks kind of like a rose, and it has kind of like a, an oval shape to its leaf. And as that plant matures, it'll get more of a willow shape and it'll get this five petal beautiful yellow flower. Uh, this plant has been in our system for quite a while. It came in like the early 50s and 1960s. There's some evidence that this plant has been in South Carolina and Georgia as early as the Civil War, but didn't really become a problem until you know later. Um, we watched this plant on the system. It, it doesn't give us a whole lot of trouble. It, it can impede navigation on some smaller canals and near some you know residential areas, but for the most part, it provides Pretty good fish and um, you know aquatic insect environment. The dragonfly larvae love it. Fish love to you know hide in it. Um, one thing I do want to note about this plant, and we talked about this plant earlier. This is alligator weed, which looks very similar, and it's really easy to tell the difference at the moment because they both have their blooms. And alligator weed has this nice clover little white flower, and they both have leaves that look similar. But when there's no flower on the plant, an easy way that you can identify them when you're out is if you snap the stem of water primrose open, and you can see that it's solid. When you snap the stem open of alligator weed, it's hollow. So when you don't have the blooms to go off of, you can use that indicator to let you know what plant you're looking at. So this is what I've heard referred to as a leaf cutter moth. Um, and what they'll do is they actually chew off pieces of this uh, fragrant water lily or um, crested floating heart or banana lily and they kind of hide themselves inside this leaf right here. So if you peel that off, you can see the little, it's, it's really a caterpillar, um, an aquatic caterpillar that lives in here and it'll eventually wrap itself up in a cocoon and um, become a moth. The plant that I'm holding here is called water hyacinth or Cornea craspes. And this is a plant that uh, has, a, has a fun story uh, um, for everybody. I, I'm a big history buff, so I enjoy talking about this one. In 1884, there was a cotton expo in New Orleans, and they brought this plant up, and it's, it's got a very pretty showy flower that has like a pretty yellow center in it, and they just gave it away as party favors. So everybody took it back across the southeast and took, put it in their, you know, their little ponds at home, and you know, when, when an invasive species gets in a spot, it just kind of grows and grows and grows, and at some point, People took them and took it from their pond and then threw it into the, the local canals and uh, lakes and it eventually took over the southeast and it's all across the country now. Another key characteristic of water hyacinth are these bulbous like petioles. So when you break them open, you see that spongy matter in there? That allows this plant to be free floating so it doesn't need to be attached to substrate in, or, substrate in order to survive. It can float across the lake system, create new colonies up against the shoreline and just float across the system. It's, uh, it can be quite problematic. Um, entire patches of water hyacinth can break off and clog entire canals and cause all kinds of problems with irrigation. It can clog up intake. So it's one that we watch on the system fairly closely. Um, with navigation, it can be in a spot one day and you know you can get your boat through and then the next day it could be an entire acre of it could move, move into it and clog, block you off. So it's something that you kind of have to be mindful and watch. So what we do in biological services is divided into two main tasks. One is water quality, 
we're basically going out and making sure everything is healthy in the water. We want lots of oxygen in the water. We're looking for uh, normal pH levels. And we're making sure there's no contaminants because there are two drinking water facilities on the lakes. Um, there's all kinds of industrial intakes. And of course, we've got to make sure all the plants and animals are healthy out there. Um, the other main aspect of our job is, we, is vegetation management. Um, we're going out and trying to reduce the number of bad species, like invasive species such as giant salvinia, uh, hydrilla, uh, water hyacinth, crested floating harp. We want fewer and fewer of those species, but we want to promote these native species, these good plants that have been here forever. Um, and we want a nice variety of those plants. We don't want just one big monoculture of hydrilla. We want all those good plants that are really healthy for ducks, for fish. You know, fishermen love them. Um, waterfowl eat all kinds of plants out here um, and, uh, and it's just more beautiful that way too.